to see you all. <laughs> Max and Pickleball afterwards. And of course, talk to Noah. Um, so I'm so glad to introduce Noah Pinto Woolman today. Noah is a professor of ecology and evolution at UCLA. And I've been a fan of her work for a long time. Um, we share a love of social insect behavior. And I really appreciate all of the cool stuff she's done on collective behavior in animals. More recently, she's branched out a lot, as you'll see. And something I love about Noah's work is the way she combines kind of fancy computational methods, or at least they seem very fancy to me, with detailed natural history. She puts them together to find some amazing stuff. And I also love that she's able to explain all this fancy computational methods in ways that even someone like me finds exciting and relevant. So I'm looking forward to hearing her talk more about the causes and consequences of social interaction. Welcome, Noah. Thank There's a couple more open chairs there if you guys want. Um, thank you so much for coming and thank you so much for the invitation and the kind introduction. I've been a fan of Liz's work for probably longer than she's been a fan of mine. So, um, all right. So it's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, so I've always been interested in how animals behave, what they do. Um, I love being in the outdoors and watching them in nature. And mostly I really like uh, thinking about how animals interact with one another and what comes out of these interactions, their social behavior, uh, the collective behavior that emerges from these interactions, and um, just figuring out why they interact the way they do and, and what are the consequences of that. And so being a student of animal behavior, I was always taught that when you look at a behavior, you want to make sure you look at the causes of a behavior and you want to look at the consequences of a behavior. And it's really important to look at them separately so that you can make hypotheses that match the level of analysis that you're looking at. Um, but over the years, looking at both causes and consequences of social behavior, um, I've learned the importance of also thinking about the feedback between the consequences and causes and how um, they interact with each other and not just uh, separating um, and so what I'm hoping to do today with this talk is go through um, a few uh, research uh, stories from my lab that use uh, this, that examine both causes and consequences of social interactions and use uh, these systems to also look at the feedbacks between the two. And so the first project I'll talk about um, is in honeybees, uh, looking at how genetically mediated individual variation in behavior influences social interactions, in turn influences collective behavior, and then the collective behavior that emerges uh, feedback, feeds back onto the individual variation in behavior. Uh, the second topic I'll talk about is the impact of the spatial environment on collective behavior, um, how the spaces that we all occupy, um, in this case, ants living inside nests, how the nests influence their collective behavior, their, the way they interact, and then in turn, how the behavior of the ants influences the structure of their nests that then feed back, feeds back onto the interactions. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about um, more recent work on interactions in different situations. So we're interacting here in one social situation. Later, we'll be playing pickleball. So that's a completely different situation. We'll have dinner and one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings. And all these different situations in different uh, situations combine together to form a social structure. And so looking at how interactions in different situations um, merge together to form these uh, social structures, and then what are the causes and consequences of these um, multifaceted interactions. So I'll jump straight into it, um, talking about the Honeybee Project. So uh, this is a project where uh, it was a really, really fun project. We got to combine uh, many levels of analysis, all the way from the genes through the individual, through um, the social behavior, and linking to ecology. Um, we, uh, this is a collaborative work with uh, Brian Smith from SU, who was funded by the NIH. Um, and along with Brian Smith, uh, we worked with three fantastic postdocs, Chelsea, Natalie, and Diago. Um, and we combined lab work with field work with uh, some simulations and educational work. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit about um, this project. So the question that we were looking into is how can we link learning behavior to collective outcomes. So it turns out that honeybees have uh, one of the many things that they can learn is learning to be bored of a stimulus that's not interesting. And so for those of you who haven't worked much with, with honeybee learning, um, there's a fairly standardized uh, assay called the proboscis extension response where 
we strap a bee into a little uh, straw and we can give it um, some scent and then give it a reward like sugar and it'll stick out its tongue, a little proboscis, if it likes the odor that we gave it. And we can basically couple um, certain odors with reward. We can couple odors with uh, things that are not reward, reward, uh, rewarding uh, and teach bees to differentiate between different odors um, and different stimuli. And so in this case, what we do is we first, we strap a bee in and we expose it to a certain odor, let's say some citrus, 40 times, and in none of these times do we give them any reward. So they learn basically that the citrus odor doesn't give any sugar. So they basically stop um, sticking out their tongue uh, for when, when they smell this odor because nothing is gonna come, there's not gonna be any sugar. Uh, but turns out that if we then start coupling this uh, unrewarding stimulus with sugar, some bees will uh, readily learn it and some bees will um, decide it will take them much, much longer to learn. And so this is what the learning curves look like. So here we have a number of trials in which we paired the odor with a reward after we exposed the bee to 40 exposures with no reward in the stimulus. And what we see is that um, the percentage of bees responding kind of is, is bimodal. We have bees that will readily learn this odor, they will readily learn this association between this odor that up until now was not rewarding and all of a sudden it's starting to be rewarding, they'll be like, oh great, we don't care that it didn't reward us until now, now it is and we'll learn it. And then there's these ones um, that basically have become bored of that stimulus. They're like, ah, 40 times, it never gave us anything. We don't care that you're giving us sugar now, we're not gonna bother learning this association and it takes them much longer to um, learn that odor. And so we call these individuals, um, individuals with high latent inhibition. Um, so high likelihood to become bored and um, these individuals low latent inhibition so they don't uh, become inhibited of this uh, boring stimulus. And so um, this is an essay that Brian already had seen and worked on and he hypothesized, and this is all in the lab. And so we asked, what does this have to do with the ecology and the biology and the behavior of the bees? And so our, our hypothesis was that um, these bees that get bored fast are ones that go and explore the environment and find new things. Um, so they're the ones who will go and find new things, whereas bees are the ones that will exploit um, the resources that are found. Because uh, even if they were, they came to flowers that have already been depleted, if they're told that there is a good reward, they'll still go to it. And so in bees, we have uh, different types of foragers. Some are scouts and some are recruits. And so we went out to the field, we collected individuals that are considered scouts, we collected individuals that are considered recruits. We put them through this essay and it turns out that the scouts all, and most of the scouts were indeed um, these low latent inhibition and the recruits were these high latent inhibition. So we're really happy we can connect this learning um, behavior that's assayed in the lab with something ecological, with a behavior that we see in the field. Moreover, we found that um, this latent inhibition behavior is linked to um, how well individuals interact with one another. So probably most of you know that honeybees interact with each other through this uh, elaborate dance. And so we went and looked at the dances um, of the high ally and the low ally bees inside uh, the nest. And what we found was that um, if we look at these high ally bees in red and low ally bees in, low, in, in yellow, um, the more they dance, the longer the dan they dance, the more followers they will have. So the more excited the bees in the, in the hive will be um, and kind of will follow them and go out. Uh, but it turns out that the high ally individuals are much more efficient at recruiting uh, their, their nest mates to um, uh, flowers outside, to food outside the nest uh, compared to the lower. So we have this learning behavior that is linked to a foraging behavior that is linked to the way that individuals interact with one another. So we already have this uh, kind of causes of social interactions, right? Um, now, how, what are the consequences of this variation in foraging behavior and in uh, ability to interact? So to do that, we went back to some, um, a little uh, thought exercise that I wrote about a long time ago. Um, if we see colonies in the field, um, we'll often see variation in how good they are at foraging. So we'll see whether it's ants or bees uh, or wasps, 
we'll see that some colonies are really, uh, for example, fast at finding food and others are really slow at finding food. And there's different hypotheses to explain why we see this variation if we consider the composition, the behavioral composition of these colonies. So one hypothesis is um, that colonies that are very good at finding food maybe have overall uh, workers that are more exploratory. They go around more, they find more food, and so that's why we see this uh, red colony being a faster foraging colony than the blue one. Um, we could also have differences in distribution. So maybe the mean of the behavior is the same, but the distributions are different. And maybe the red colony is faster because it has a few individuals that are really, really good at finding food and they recruit everyone else. So we have these synergistic effects. And maybe there is no difference in worker composition and there's something about the environment. Maybe the um, blue colony is under a tree and so it's shaded and overall they're uh, less active than the red colony. And so in this um, system of honeybees, we could actually test these hypotheses. And while they're not completely mutually exclusive, uh, we could still have predictions uh, for one or the other. And so, oh, shoot, I'm sorry. Pressed the wrong button. Um, so I know that a lot of this, these behavioral differences are genetically mediated. Turns out uh, we can test, just like we test the workers in that little um, strap, just as we can strap workers into um, little straws, we can also strap queens and drones. And we see variation between queens in their latent inhibition and between drones. And when we mate them, the offspring match um, the uh, phenotype of the queens and the drones that we mated. So we created um, colonies from queens that were high ally queens that were mated with high ally drones, high, low ally queens that were mated with low ally drones. And then we also created mixed colonies that had workers that came from these yellow queens and workers that came from those red queens um, and we placed them together and we asked how well they find uh, food. And then we had a control of basically queens that got to mate with whoever they wanted. And so this is what we found. Um, if we looked at the number of visits to a feeder that we gave the bees and we could track uh, bees coming to visit the um, feeders over time, we found that the high eye uh, colonies were um, the best at finding those uh, feeders and visited them the most. And those mixed individual, those mixed colonies fell right in between um, the low lie and the high lie, which suggests some additive uh, effects here. And so we have, um, we can already see the causal link between this individual variation that is genetically mediated um, onto the consequences of these social interactions that um, mediate foraging behavior. But what about this feedback that I was talking about? So um, when I was doing my lab, we really wanted to see whether this relationship between um, these different compositions in a colony have anything to do with the distribution of the food in nature. Because what we end up, well, in this uh, plot, we saw that the hyalai uh, were kind of the best at finding food. The control colonies were actually very similar to low li uh, colonies. And in fact, the low LI is the predominant phenotype that we see in nature. So we thought, well, maybe um, being high LI isn't the best thing in the world in all conditions. And so um, we tested the success of colonies in different types of environments. And I won't go into a lot of details because I want to have time for my other stories. Um, we ran some agent-based simulations where we gave uh, simulated colonies resources that are differently distributed, either they were all dispersed or clumped, and we had different qualities of food. So we had high quality food, medium quality food, and low quality food. And we asked if the simulated bees can distinguish between them, and if they do, um, if they do differently, uh, if they have different payoffs in clumped versus dispersed, and we manipulated the proportions of high LI and low LI in our uh, simulated bees. And we got pretty interesting results that were not expected. And the results were that they, uh, the, the distribution of resources didn't matter. Uh, high LI and low LI, the proportion of them didn't change the ability of the colonies to find the food. But what did matter was the, the um, quality of the food. And so it turned out that the low LI colonies were much better at distinguishing the food uh, quality between the different patches. And we were a little bit surprised because that is not what we expected. Um, but oftentimes, you know, agents based simulations, like they 
what, we were like, well, maybe we didn't get everything. Uh, let's go see what happens in the field. So we basically reproduce these simulations in the field in um, kind of big, big exposures, uh, big enclosures where we had a colony of either high li or low li, and we either had the, dis the foods dispersed or clumped, and they ha we had different quality foods. And um, this was the, probably one of the most rewarding uh, papers that combined simulations and fieldwork. The fieldwork matched exactly our simulations, which was kind of surprising. And so we started thinking, well, what is going on? Because we had a different expectation. Um, and so what we came up with is the idea that um, they're not just explorers and exploiters, but high li bees are the ones that find the food, and then the low li bees are the ones that refine the decision. So in this situation where the feeders were actually relatively close, they can find all this food. So it didn't really matter how much high li individuals they had. But having more low LIs allowed them to distinguish the different quality foods because uh, they're the ones who are key to um, these details. So they're the more detail-oriented individuals, the ones that don't get bored of uh, unrewarding stimulus, and they can refine the foraging behavior of the colony. So with that, um, we basically went through from causes and, and multiple levels of analysis, from genetics uh, to individual behavior, through their impact on foraging behavior, uh, social interactions, the way the collective uh, forages for food, and then how this uh, ability to collect food in different environments of different qualities might then impact the success of the colony in producing more honeybees uh, and potentially of different types um, that will continue this cycle. The next story I want to tell you is about the impact of spatial environment on interactions and underlying collective behavior. And so if anyone has looked uh, um, at ants for even a short amount of time, you might have wondered, um, what do ants do underground? So you've seen ants walk around, and then they go and they disappear in the ground. And uh, during that second month of the pandemic, my uh, kid and I were wondering the same thing. And we came up with a bunch of hypotheses, one of which is uh, watching Star Wars and eating popcorn. So that's a testable hypothesis. <laughs> <laughs> but they also probably raise their brood and store their food and take care of it. And for a bit more realistic view of what happens inside um, a nest, this is a cast of the nest. Um, it's a plastic cast. And what we'll do is we'll basically enter the cast and kind of get an ant's view uh, perspective. We'll go in through the entrance here and kind of fly through um, the nest through the tunnels and chambers, just as an ant would when it goes into a nest. Give you a little. Um, I think it was like a computer game. Yeah. And then, um, so this is a cast that I'll talk about a little bit later. And then we can actually look at what ants do in the field inside the nest. So here's something that I came up with during my postdoc. Um, where I replace the ceiling of the first chamber that ants arrive at uh, with a transparent um, petri dish ceiling. So I made a glass ceiling for the ants. Um, and what you see here, this used to be the nest entrance. Um, this is the chamber that was covered and I replaced the ceiling with the petri dish. And then here we have tunnels that lead deeper into the nest. And so this provides an opportunity to see the ants coming and going, bringing food, interacting with each other. And um, this chamber is basically where a lot of the decisions are made about whether or not an ant should go and forage. So these ants forage in a desert. Um, they need to regulate whether or not to forage based on um, how hot it is, how dry it is, whether there's predators. And so they basically, uh, what you'll see occasionally is that there's an accumulation of ants here. And they'll wait for um, ants returning with food to decide whether or not they should go. And the rate of return of the ants determines whether or not they um, decide to leave. Um, and so um, this kind of allowed me to start looking at whether the architecture of this chamber influences where interactions happen. So here is the picture of that uh, chamber I showed you. And here is where interactions happen. So um, warmer colors is where we have more interactions. Colder colors is where we have fewer interactions. And you'll see that a lot of the interactions happen at where things narrow down, right? Where the tunnels enter deeper into the nest, where the entrance is, and where things kind of force ants to be close to each other. And we see variation among colonies. So I did this with different colonies. 
And we always got these hot spots of interactions near these uh, where, where things get uh, a bit more narrow. Um, so we already see evidence for the spatial structure, the structure of the net in this case, influencing where interactions happen. I investigated the, a little bit more how this happens, and one of um, the ideas was, well, uh, as I suggested already, that the structure of the nest influences how ants move around and forces ants to move next to each other and interact. Um, and I showed this using some uh, work in the lab where we had a lab-based colony. And again, I could follow all the ants and their trajectories. And I found that there, we have these hotspots of interactions right next to the um, tubes that lead ants deeper into the nest. And it turns out that the more time an ant spends at these interaction hotspots, the more central it is in the social network. So if there's variation among individuals in how much time they spend in at these interaction hotspots, at these tighter spots uh, architecturally, we will start seeing variation among individuals in how they interact overall. I supplemented this with some simulations just to show uh, this further. So I simulated ants walking around uh, without any individual variation in their walking patterns versus those that have variation in walking patterns. And when I implemented variation in walking patterns, I found that um, these interactions happen closer, interactions tend to happen closer to the border of the arena, the computer arena, uh, whereas when there was no individual variation, the hotspot, the interaction hotspots happened anywhere. Um, and just kind of to further uh, confirm this, I removed the boundaries. So I maintained the high individual variation in walking patterns, uh, but I had uh, ants walk on the terrace, so they uh, didn't have a boundary here around them. And again, these interaction hotspots happened at various places. So really, it's the combination of having these uh, spatial constraints that uh, shape the way that ants can move around and having individual variation in walking patterns that results in these more interesting interaction networks where individuals uh, differ in how they interact with one another and um, and then in turn, that potentially impacts uh, things like foraging behavior. And so the consequences of these interactions, um, my postdoc advisor Deborah Gordon has looked a long time at uh, how these harvester ants uh, feed, but we never really saw the direct link between interactions and foraging behavior until I made these windows into this entrance chamber. And we were able to find that um, we see more interactions or higher interaction rate when uh, we provide the colonies with seeds and there's high foraging rate. Um, so here you have the high foraging rate in dark blue and low foraging rate periods in uh, light blue. And we see a lot more interactions when food is available compared when, uh, to when food is less available. So we see a direct link here be between interactions and foraging behavior. Um, okay, so we have uh, this link through a, a spatial influence on interactions. Um, and interactions influencing forager, but can we link uh, the spatial uh, constraints to foraging directly? So to look into that, I moved to studying a slightly different harvester ant, the true har harvester ant, Veronesser andreae. Uh, they changed their name since you last surveyed them, maybe. Um, and so these are ants uh, at Jasper Ridge. Uh, and the nice thing about the Veronesser andreae is that they relocate between uh, nests. And so what you see here is a relocation of a colony. They're moving um, the content of their nest from a nest that's all the way down here to about 30 meters down the road. Um, you can see them carrying uh, the brood. You can see the alates that they're preparing for the flight. Everyone is just moving in that direction to the nest. And so what this system allowed me to do was to look at the foraging behavior of these colonies in one nest wait for them to relocate to a new nest, and then uh, pour plaster down the old nest that they vacated, so no ants were harmed in the process, um, and quantify the structure of the nest that was vacated and link it to the foraging behavior that I quantified before they left. And so um, here's back to that nest that I flew, we flew through earlier. So I was able to quantify um, these uh, casts uh, identify where uh, we have chambers, where we have tunnels, and so on. Uh, we di I digitized them and I turned them into networks because I like networks if you haven't guessed that yet. Um, and so now that we had networks, we could quantify things like the connectivity of the chambers. Um, and one thing that I will 
to pay attention to is uh, what we call a cycle. So this is basically a cycle in where we have multiple chambers connected and then they loop back to one another. And so th this basically uh, increases the robustness of a structure because it provides alternate routes to reach from one chamber to another. So for example, to reach from this chamber to this, you can either take this route or this route. Um, and so if a tunnel gets blocked, you have alternative routes. Whereas um, if you don't have these cycles, you have only one route. And so if something happens to the route on the way, um, it's broken and, and the um, network breaks down. And so I asked whether this, the recruitment to food, how quickly they um, basically recruited each other to a piece of apple before they vacated that nest, um, was linked to um, the structure of the nest that I uh, tested. And I found that uh, that entrance chamber, the one that I showed you, window of in the other species, the more connection it had, the more tunnels it had going deeper into the nest, the more, uh, the faster the recruitment. So on the y-axis here, we have the speed of recruitment. And here we have the number of connections that an entrance chamber has. So the more connections of an entrance chamber, the more, uh, the faster foraging that you see. Um, overall connectivity, so how much all the other chambers are connected to one another, also correlated nicely with uh, boarding speed. And finally, these cycles that I mentioned, uh, the more of these cycles that we have, the faster recruitment we see again. We have more path to go, um, to the connect between the different chambers, and um, there's re redundancy and, and robustness there. Interestingly, the um, Recruitment speed had no relationship with the volume of the chambers. So I measured the volume of these cats, and there was no relationship between how quickly ants recruit and how big their nest is, which suggests it's not how many ants a nest can hold, but how the nest is, is organized and organizes the ants within it that became influences collective foraging. So there we have that uh, link between uh, spatial structure so what about this feedback? Um, ants are a great system, right? These structures are in fact uh, an extended phenotype of the colony. The ants dig these structures, excavate these structures, or in the case of their restaurant dry, they select these nests, uh, it's available nests in the field. And so there's a lot of potential for feedback between the collective behavior of the ants and the structure of the nest. So that led to a whole line of investigation in my lab asking, what determines the spatial constraints? What determines the structure of the nest in the first place? And we tested a bunch of things. So we asked if maybe there is this individual intrinsic variation. Do some colonies dig more chambers than others? Um, and uh, maybe there's genetic differences and so on. Uh, maybe there's something about evolutionary history and strong influence of species, um, with different species having different structures and that being more important than individual variation. Maybe something about the environment. Um, so maybe in warmer temperatures, you uh, dig different structures and in colder temperatures, maybe humidity influences, um, maybe the rockiness of the uh, habitat and so on. And then finally, looking at the actual behavior of the colony uh, that occupies this nest, um, can things like colony size, how many ants are there influence the structure of the nest? Um, and can foraging behavior, that uh, collective behavior that we looked at, can that influence the structure of the nest? Okay, so looking at the first three, uh, to look at the first three, uh, my two grad students, Eva and Sean, um, took, uh, decided to focus on these two uh, species, Bear Messiah and Dry and Pogonomonas californicus. Um, and what they did was they brought them into the lab and created this very um, nice experimental design in the lab where they took uh, ants from four different colonies in the field. They separated each one up to four different groups of 50 ants each, and they placed these ants in buckets with sand. And we put the buckets in sand in different environmental conditions, like uh, cold temperatures or hot temperatures and humid or dry conditions. Um, and we let the ants dig for about a week and we got these um, casts and quantified them, uh, digitized and quantified them. And so the first thing we found was that there was uh, slight differences between the uh, width of the tunnels of the two species. So it turns out that the Vera Messandre dug slightly uh, bigger circumference tunnels than uh, Pogonomermix. Our first explanation was, well, maybe there's differences in head size and Vera Messandre have like bigger mandibles that they can make bigger spaces. Turns out there is not significant differences in head size. Um, 
but um, Vermis and Dry have slight bigger body size than Pogonomeryx for a Californicus. Um, and this difference is significant. And so our thinking is that a tunnel uh, circumference, or like how wide a tunnel matters, because the ants need to be able to turn around and walk around in it. And so if you have a bigger, sorry, if you have a bigger body, you want the tunnel to be bigger and allow you to turn around in it. We also found individual differences between the different colonies in both uh, the number of nests with the cycle that I told you about earlier and uh, overall nest size. When we looked at the effect of temperature and humidity, the only thing we found was that um, in higher temperatures, we got, uh, oh, sorry, I lost the X label, sorry. Um, this is warm temperature, this is colder temperatures. And in, cold, in warmer temperatures, we got more nests with these cycles that I showed you before. So maybe these cycles not only help ants move around more efficiently inside the nest, maybe they also have some thermoregulatory um, aspect to them as well. So we see some evidence of um, a little bit of environmental conditions, although not as much as we thought we would see, some individual variation uh, that we can't explain, and then some differences between species. To ask if colony size has an impact on uh, nest structure, we went, um, so my first doctor, Lee Miller at the time, asked how colony size relates to nest structure by uh, doing a meta-analysis, a comparative uh, study of different ant species. And so she went to the literature and found uh, as many uh, casts of nests that she could find, of as many ant species that she could find. And she looked up the size of the colonies of each ant species. And her, she predicted um, that species with larger colonies will have more chambers um, in, their, in their nests, that they will have larger chambers, and that they will have more connections, more connectivity in their nests. And so using this uh, big meta-analysis that compares different species, she found that uh, species that had larger colonies overall had more chambers, but um, their chambers were not larger. And this makes a lot of sense if you think about a, a colony of ants as a superorganism and equate it to other organisms we can think about. So elephants don't have bigger cells than mice, but they do have more cells than mice. So just like uh, what we see in the animal kingdom where we have more cells uh, in bigger animals, we see more chambers in bigger colonies, but we don't see bigger cells or bigger chambers in bigger animals. And finally, she also found that connectivity increased with colonies. So we saw evidence of um, more colony size increased with, uh, sorry, number of chambers and connectivity increased with colony size. What about uh, foraging behavior? So my grad student, Sean, um, during the pandemic, decided to uh, continue this uh, work with the, with the big data set that Julie already created and supplemented with even more nests and more species. And so he also took this comparative approach, um, comparing different species of ants and he also quantified the nest. He was interested in the width of the entrance chamber, that chamber where decisions about foraging happen, how deep the nest is, um, and how deep the nest is. And he um, categorized, categorized each species we had in our data set to different stra foraging strategies. We had the solitary foragers that basically don't recruit others. We have group rec recruitment where an individual will find food and then recruit a small number of ants. Uh, we have colonies with stable trails that basically have these, uh, kind of like the leaf cutter ants that have these stable trails that just constantly move to fetch resources. And then we have mass recruitment where um, ants will recruit and the recruitment will be basically massive of many, many, many hundreds of ants coming out to forage. And so basically uh, these two types of foraging require recruitment and these two don't rely as much on recruitment. And so what John found was, um, that the depth of a nest, so how deep it goes, was higher in these stable trail and mass trail species and smaller in these solitary foraging and group recruitment foraging and, and group recruitment species. And uh, these actually map quite nicely on colony size. So usually uh, species with stable trails and mass recruitment are much bigger than uh, solitary foragers or group recruitment. So that matches a little bit what Julie found. He also found that this entrance chamber, right, that chamber where decisions about foraging are made, corrected for body length, because we saw that body length matters, um, is highest, is, is largest in the, these species where recruitment happens. 
So if you're a species of ant that um, is recruiting other individuals to a food source, you're going to have a larger inference chamber where you can have these social interactions and make these social decisions. Um, and uh, yeah, lovely. <laughs> so uh, we now have a start of an understanding of how the behavior, this collective behavior of ants that emerge from interactions which are influenced by the spatial environment can influence and, and um, determine the spatial environment in which all this happens. And so this is a really nice system to look at this detail. Okay, last story. Um, so interactions uh, happen in different situations. Um, on my second slide, I showed you many, many types of interactions. So animals interact in many different situations. It could be a mating situation, it could be parental care, it could be other social interactions, it could be aggression, it could be affiliative interactions. And so one of the things that we started looking at is how do interactions in these different social situations combine together to result in collective outcomes or in uh, social outcomes. So I'll, um, I have three systems and but like 15 minutes. <laughs> um, so first we looked at the Argentine ant. Uh, it's an invasive species that's very uh, common around campus. And uh, Julian Postdoc brought in some Argentine ants into the lab and she fed them with fluorescent food. Um, so we could start tracking uh, the food content of, the ant, of these ants because their abdomen uh, stretches when they feed. And so if they feed fluorescent, on fluorescent food, and their abdomen stretches and we can see the fluorescence uh, in their abdomen. And we can also see when they're um, basically uh, offering food to other ants. So she uh, couldn't basically starved colonies and then fed them and looked at the interactions inside the nest um, for about 30 minutes. And she identified different types of interactions, trophallaxis, which is food exchange, antenation, which is just like antenating with your um, antennas, and mouth to mouth, if you don't have a picture of it, it's basically two ants standing mouth to mouth and not exchanging food. And she asked, how do these different interactions influence the decision of a forager to leave the nest and continue foraging? And so we basically looked at how long a forager um, spends in the, in the nest and how long it took it to leave after an interaction. Um, and so as expected, we found that the more time a forager spent in the nest, uh, the more interactions it had. But when we looked at the proportion of the different types of interactions, the only interaction that mattered was trophallaxis. And it didn't matter if she fed, uh, she did trophallaxis with an ant that was already fed or an ant that was hungry. Um, the proportion of trophallaxis uh, determines the duration of the forager in the nest, but not the other, the proportion of other interactions. And um, the latency to leave the nest was influenced by interactions with fed ants, but not with hungry ants. So it's not just the type of interaction, but also who you interact with. So we can already see evidence of um, different type of interactions uh, influencing collective behavior differently, because we're considering the proportion of them rather than just the actual number. Another system in which uh, we looked at uh, different types of interactions, and I had to put this because it's wasps and I cannot put wasps or emblemas. <laughs> um, this is a work uh, by Nunica, who is my postdoc, uh, and she actually took some work uh, from the time she was a uh, grad student with Archie. And during her PhD, she collected a lot of really fine detailed uh, interaction data on wasps in different situations. So um, just whether or not they hang out with each other spatially, whether they're aggressive to each other, whether they exchange food, uh, either liquid food and trophallaxis or solid food. And then this particular uh, species of wasp, uh, there's one, one individual who's a queen. And if something happens to that queen, another uh, individual will emerge and become a queen. And she's considered a potential queen. And for decades, they had no idea what predicts this potential queen. Like, who is this individual that takes the place of the dead queen? Uh, nothing about the size of the ovaries or the behavior that they could um, look at predicted this. Um, so we came, we, we looked at Nidica's, um data in a slightly different way. We combined these different social situations, either by aggregating all the behaviors together or by keeping this multi-layered um, structure where we also consider not just how many interactions each individual has in each uh, situation, but also taking into account how many, how many interactions they have in other situations and still maintaining the situation separate. And so what you see here, each uh, thing is a different social situation. So this one is uh, solid food exchange. Uh, there's one for 
aggression, one for prophylaxis, and so on. And each wedge is an individual. And here is this potential queen, the PQ. And we found that the only way, uh, and we have uh, an aggregate where all the interactions are smushed together and the multilayer network. And the darker that it is, the, more, the higher red the individual is. And we found that in all five colonies that she looked at, um, the, potential, the observed potential queen at her rank was significantly higher than random only when we considered all uh, interactions in the multilayer network structure. So we already have two examples of uh, how interactions in different spatial in different situations uh, combine to affect uh, important uh, collective outcomes. What about the causes of these different social interactions? So I don't have a lot about this yet. Um, I'll just show you a quick um, something quick because it's really cool. Uh, we started supplement augmenting um, Julie's uh, feeding, feeding ants with uh, this fluorescent food with tagging them with these two key barcodes. And so we can now, and, and by we, I mean Joe, <laughs> that uh, was a postdoc in my lab, and we were, this is work in collaboration with Dana and Matt, um, where we're looking at how uh, can we learn anything about supply chains from ants. Um, so it's still a work in progress a little bit. Um, but what we can now do is track individuals and uh, for a long time, because they have these two barcodes that are the uniquely identified them. And we can look at the food content they have and, and how they transfer this food from one another. Um, and just to give you a kind of brief overlook at what we are starting to see, um, group size influences how much um, influences the interaction structure, number of clusters is the group, number of clusters in the network. What you feed them influences how they interact with each other. So if you feed them with protein, they tend to be more clicky and clustered than if you feed them carbohydrates. And if you limit the food, they tend to be more clicky um, than if you give them unlimited food. And also for each individual, if you look at the individual level, um, the number of unique individual anyone interacts with is much higher when they're fed with carbohydrates compared to when they're fed with protein. It increases with group size, as we would expect. Um, and also uh, food limitation has some impact there, uh, but more so on carbohydrates than on protein. <coughs> Okay, so we see that uh, group size, what you eat, uh, how, much you, how much food you have can influence how you interact, which influences collective foraging decisions and whether or not to keep on foraging. And so if that influences whether or not to keep on foraging, that will determine how hungry the colony is, how much food it has, what kind of food it gets, and feedback onto the group. Okay, um, I promised birds, <laughs> so here we go. There's birds in the pictures, so um, we made it to them. Okay, so when thinking about these interactions in different situations, uh, a few years ago now, well, almost eight years ago, uh, I met a movement ecologist, uh, Or Spiegel, who's also really interested in social networks. And uh, I don't hold it against him, but he studies birds. And uh, he studies specifically vultures. And we started talking and thinking about these social interactions and how, spatial be how the spatial environment influences their movement and how that influences how they interact. We wrote a grant together, um, got funding to study uh, basically the links between social and spatial interactions and how they influence ecological processes in this um, species of vulture in Israel. And uh, when I say we, this is a huge team effort. Um, and at this point, uh, we're about year three or four in the grant, and we have now tagged pretty much the entire population of vultures in Israel because. Uh, that population is locally endangered, and so there's only about 100 or so individuals. And they all now, well, about 80 to 90% of them have a GPS tracker um, that has uh, some solar charge batteries. So these tags uh, basically tell us where each vulture is uh, every 10 minutes, um, and the, the tags last for years. Uh, and so we get this full data of their movements um, around Israel, mostly in the southern part of Israel. And we can infer from these interactions, because of the high uh, spatial and temporal resolution, uh, we can infer when individuals interact. So for example, here, you see the dark blue individual and the light blue individual uh, flying together at the same time. You see these co-flight events, um, so they interact in a co-flight situation. And here you have these two light green and dark green individuals coming to roost together, so they uh, interact when they're roosting. And then we can also identify interactions at feeding sites when they're feeding and, and look at the co-feeding. Um, and so this gives us an opportunity to look at interactions in different situations. And so 
Nitika basically took what she developed for the wasps and applied it to um, the vultures. And she found that um, individuals have different ranks in different situations. So for example, again, every wedge is an individual, every ring is a different situation. And so for example, this uh, J36 is highly ranked in the roosting. Uh, so it means it, it is very interactive in roosting, but not so much in flying or in feeding. Uh, similarly, J15 is very interactive in feeding, but not in the other situations. So individuals differ in their social position across situations. And we found that uh, different situations contribute differently to the aggregate structure. So what we have here is a relationship between uh, how many interactions an individual has uh, when it's flying compared to how many interactions it has when you put all of these together. And we looked at this relationship between uh, interactions in each layer in the, ag in the aggregate. And we found that this relationship is much stronger uh, than expected at random, which are these red red plots. Um, when we look at uh, how many unique individuals it, uh, vultures interact with, but only when we consider uh, social situations that happen during the day, so flight and feeding. So basically flight and feeding contribute to the number of unique individuals you see uh, more than roosting. In fact, roosting is negatively related to that. Uh, but when you think about how many individuals you, you tend to interact with, it's these ground interactions that have the biggest influence on um, how many individuals you tend to interact with. Um, these interactions have a lot of uh, consequences. Uh, for example, vultures use interactions to find food. Uh, they're scavengers, they need uh, these social cues. And of course, uh, since they're scavengers and they're picking on each other and fighting with each other while they're eating, there's implications for disease transmission. Um, currently, my, my current postdoc, Elvira, and Neely, who's a vet and at Beaches University of Israel, are working on this. Um, and then, uh, in terms of ca causes of these interactions, my current PhD student, Taya, is starting to look at what causes, what determines whether or not you're going to be a central individual, and whether it's linked to how a vulture moves around. And then, uh, hopefully, next year she'll get to how the spatial environment, and for example, whether there's cliffs that allow vultures to use thermals, or whether there is feeding station influences the movement of the vultures. And just a really quick sneak peek to what she's finding. Uh, the number of interactions is influenced by movement, uh, such that uh, if you uh, move more, you actually interact with fewer individuals in roosting and feeding situations. Surprisingly, flight had no influence. And we look at um, in the unique individuals, uh, flight and roosting have a big influence. And movement has a big influence on this in flight and roosting, but not in feeding. Okay, um, and so moving forward, uh, where you end up eating will determine who you interact with, how you move around, um, and can get feedback on this uh, structure. All right, so I made it through all the stories, um, and hopefully uh, I convince you that it's not, uh, that we should examine both causes and consequences of behavior, but also how the consequences feed back onto causes and finding systems where we can um, examine the this is pretty fun and exciting. And with that, I'd like to thank a lot of collaborators, postdoc students, funding agencies, and many places that allowed us to conduct this research in. And if there's time, I'll take some questions. Yes, we do have time for questions. Amazing job. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. I have a question about the transport. Mm -hmm. But they are the most interesting ones. A couple of years ago, I asked a bunch of plant people what they thought the most interesting kind of was in the environment. And the best was bees for me. I got lots of weird answers, but I'm interested in what you think. Um, well, I, I can draw from uh, basically Argentine. I think they're really, really good at finding food. And they're very vicious when they find other ants. So I think being vicious and good at finding food. But not um, I think nest architecture can relate to that. So being able to find food can be impacted by the nest architecture. So yes, but in yeah, true that. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so um, I did follow some ants in the lab. Like I, I marked them individually and followed their interactions over a while. I ended up never getting published because the sample size wasn't huge, but um, the gist of it was that they do tend to be persistent over a few days, um, but over a week or two, the persistence kind of goes away. Um, and we know that there's this temporal polyethism where ants move, uh, just like honeybees, will move from one task to another. They move from inside tasks to outside tasks. Um, I don't know that the two, you know, the few days to a week is exactly the time scale of this change in their tasks, but um, could, you know, be some, you know, that they have some spatial fidelity for a few days and then they tend to go somewhere else. Um, and obviously with this comparison, but uh, yeah, they do, they are persistent in how much they interact for a few days, but not like more than a week in that condition. Yeah, um, I think in the nest, in the ants, um, I don't know if there's a benefit to the individuals themselves. Um, so ants are all, uh, the workers are all sterile females. Um, but having this variation, so the network that I showed you that had a few individuals that are highly interactive and most individuals that are not interactive is actually very characteristic to things like air, air transportation networks. So. Um, this, the global structure of the network, like whether it's um, what we'd call like highly skewed in terms of interaction uh, connectivity, which is, I showed you a skewed one, and you compare that, I don't have that slide here, but um, like an alternative is that everyone interacts pretty much in the same way. And um, that is more characteristic, for example, of road transportation networks. And both those structures have different, be different benefits and costs to the collective, to the you know, global social system. Um, it's been shown that these highly skewed networks with few, few, few highly interactive individuals and most individuals that are not very interactive facilitate faster information flow. Uh, whereas these more uniform networks where everyone has pretty much the same number of interactions, um, information, flow is, is, information flow is slower. Um, so you could think, you know, these highly um, skewed networks are good for things like information flow, but if you think about disease transmission, maybe they're not as good. And so I think it's just a trade-off between the risk of disease transmission and the benefits of information flow about um, foraging opportunities. And in, in the ant case, um, being able to find food fast, especially in these uh, environments where they don't have a whole lot of time to find food. They are only active a very short amount of time during the day because then it gets too hot. Um, they need to be really efficient and ants just don't tend to get very sick. Um, I talked one time with someone who studies disease and ants and he was like, yeah, it's terrible. I can't find anything that gets sick. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're very good at cleaning themselves and at getting rid of sick individuals. So it seems like disease transmission is less of a pressure on the structure of the network compared to being efficient forager. So collectively, yes, there is an advantage to having individuals that are highly interactive. At the individual level, I don't know if there's an if there's some advantage to being that highly attractive ant or not. I mean, it might even be a disadvantage because maybe you spend too much energy or something. I'm not sure. But yeah. So what Richard's saying suggests that there could be an optimal nest structure in mm -hmm. the ants. And yeah. as you uh, sort of related to that, consecutive nests with these ants that migrate, yeah. are they similar or not? Yeah, so I, I I was asked by a reviewer whether ants move to improve, right? Whether they tend to move to a nest that be, that where they become more efficient for it, they don't. Um, I think they just, well, there could be many reasons. Maybe, probably they don't know what they're doing. Um, but secondly, um, as I said, there's a lot of things that are in play. It's not just foraging that they need to optimize. They also need to make sure that there's enough room for all the ants in there. Um, you know, that it's protected from predators. There's other um, constraints. That, have, that that are uh, put on those nest structures. So I think there's, the more interesting option is that there's other things that determine uh, the nest structure. Like I showed you, there's you know environmental features, there's um, differences between species, there's um, colony size and so on. So I think um, combining them and trying to optimize all of them, maybe there is the perfect nest. Um, and so one of the things we wanna do moving forward is actually 
giving um, and raising ant colonies in different nest structures and then moving them into structures that are mismatched to what they constructed using um, kind of 3D printing and, and our laser cutter. Um, so that's down the line. Hopefully, one grad student will get to it one day, or many grad students will get to that one day. Um, but yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. The thing, the question back to you is, what are we trying to optimize? So there's lots of things. All right, if you guys uh, want to meet out there, go take a while with Snap and more Noah. But for now, <laughs> let's thank you all so much.